Um, I'm going to talk about clinician science, but obviously it may not be for everyone. At the end of my talk, I don't know whether I will convince you to be one or convince you to not to become one. But this is my story that I'd like to share, the long and winding road in becoming a clinician scientist. This is my disclosure, and I'm on the board of director of this three company, AstraZeneca, Hutchmat, and Insighter. So start with the first question. What the heck is a clinician scientist? Well, I think it's actually very straightforward. Clinician science is a doctor plus a researcher being the same person. And then the research can be a basic research translation research or clinical research, depending on your specialty or area of interest. So that is the definition. But the next question is that, why do you want to be one? Well, it has to be fun, exciting, and rewarding. Okay, that's the background of whatever you want to do in your future, whether a scientist or a teacher or whatever. you got to be fun, exciting, and rewarding all in one. So as a doctor... I think it's really quite rewarding in a way is that you can really help the patient directly. And that is an immediate reward in a sense that you help someone, someone reward you with a smile. And also mentally, it's quite challenging that you'll be able to use the science that you know and apply in the clinic and change the life of a patient. And of course, in Hong Kong especially, uh, the doctor profession is still being respected and relatively well compensated. So those are the, all the reasons why you don't want to become a doctor. But then why do you want to be a researcher in the same time? Well, being a researcher, I think it's actually very rewarding that you can create science that change clinical practice. You practice medicine, but then people actually follow the science that you created. That is a good feeling. And also the mental challenge is the fact that you see a problem in the clinic and you take it back to a laboratory or you work for drug development, you work for diagnostic, such that you change your practice and provide a solution. And of course, if you're successful, you probably will be well respected in the community. And then, of course, if you're able to commercialize, as suggested by uh, Dr. Sun Dong, then actually there was a great financial reward potentially as well. So there's a lot of good plus, but the journey is long and winding. So first of all, no matter where you are, whether it's Singapore or India or Hong Kong, <clears throat> first step is enroll, enrollment in medical school. And that already takes a lot of your energy, I presume. Uh, I'm quite sure that some of you may be on the road already and you know how much it takes to get a good grade so that you can enroll in medical school. After that, <clears throat> you eventually graduated do your houseman or internship. Then you have to choose your specialty training. Now, it's unlikely that you can be a general practitioner and a researcher. You have got to be a specialized in one area. So you need your specialist training. And eventually, after your training, then you may join university as an assistant professor. That is the so-called the step one of becoming an academic. Now, from medical school to become an assistant professor, minimum 12 years. Now, you can start counting. You may be 18 now. By the time you finish, you're already almost close to 30. That is how long it takes, a lot of hard work. But in between, not everyone from medical school will end up this journey, but how do we select? Well, in the Chinese university, we have something called a GPS program that we allow the top student to be able to involve them with some research. So you got to get a taste of what research is like. And then when you become a doctor and doing your specialist training, then you continue to do some clinical or laboratory research. So give you some potential so that you can be considered to become an academic. So that itself is hard work. But then from assistant professor, it's just an entry level. Then you probably need to become associate professor before you really set your foot on an academic career. And that usually takes about five to six years, depending on how smart you are and how hard you work. And in the meantime, you really work the butt off. Why? Because you really have to manage the clinical part of your job. But in the same time, you have to do research on the side because you have to establish your ability to do research. But after that, then you work even harder. Oh, and it may take God knows how long that you will eventually become a full professor because the criteria of becoming one is quite harsh. 
So being recognized as a clinician scientist is a progressive process, depending on your production, depending on how good you are, and eventually you die or retire. So that is a long and winding journey. But allow me to share my journey. So <clears throat> my journey is not as smooth. It's long and winding as well. But this is where I start. A dumb looking kid. So honestly, I wasn't too that smart. I'm not that smart either. So in, as a child, I just like to play. And then I don't really focus much on academic work. But eventually, I become a boarder, a, you know, in the boarding school at St. Stephen College in Stanley. Very nice and Marleman, but in the same time, there's a lot of things to play. Basketball, swimming, canoeing, everything you name it is available in this boarding school. So I'd rather choose to play than work. So my early Form 1 and Form 2, take a guess, how good was I? Well, I'm not at the bottom, but close to it. That's my ranking in a class of 39. That's about where I am. But then what changed my life? Well, actually, it changed my life in Form 3 by a number. A number you're very familiar with. A number that's attached to uh, the, the Academy of Science. That is Pi. So at that time, as a kid, nothing else to do. You just try to memorize how long you can memorize the Pi. You know. Bah, 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 bah. And then we just start our competition from there. But from the memorization of the pine, we start to memorize the textbook, start to get competing in academic. And from there, I start to go back to my academic journey. So that helped me to improve my academic work. And eventually, I was actually I received my third education in Canada and got enrolled in medical school. And then I did quite okay. And then I become a specialist uh, training in oncology. And I finished the training in oncology and become an oncologist. However, did I really move to academic work because I'm very keen to become a clinician scientist? I kind of think about it. But you know, something happened. It may happen to you as well. Something dramatic that changed your life is that your son is born. So my son born at the time of my completion of my academic, uh, academic training in oncology, if I stay on academic to do a PhD, I have to be quite poor. And then I have to support the family. And so I decided to say, hey, I have to support my family. So I decided to do prior practice in Canada, in Toronto. And then it turned out that I can speak Cantonese and English. Then I have a lot of Chinese patients and I build a rather big practice. So you may ask how to come back to become an academic. <clears throat> well, it is um, <clears throat> quite incidental. I was practicing in a small community hospital called the Scarborough Grace Hospital, where a lot of Chinese live around that area and relatively popular because I can speak the language. And only in 1995 that I actually happened to come back to Hong Kong to visit family. And I met up with one of the younger professors that I met in a, con I met in a conference. Uh, he's Dr. Uh, Thomas Leung. And he, I just visited him in the CUHK. And then it um, happened that they got a vacancy and they offered it to me. So I have to make the decision of flying all the way back to the Prince of Wales Hospital at the Chinese University of Hong Kong to take up the position as an assistant professor. Well, it's a different story why I make the decision, but I think this is one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. So I got a detour from a prior practice. I actually come back to become a junior assistant professor at the age of 36. All right, <clears throat> so how did it go? Well, I come back in 1996. That is a good 27 years ago, 26, 27 years ago. What happened to my academic journey? When I first come back, remember, I was in private practice. So I really have no publication for the student. Publication is the demonstration of your research work. So how many publications you have just demonstrate how much research you have done uh, to be recognized in the scientific community. At that time, it was zero for me. I was poor academically. I did work hard. 
And my first publication was actually come only three years later. You can imagine a three year working in the academic setting that you don't really have a significant publication that about that. I won't go through much detail, but then my major publication, International Recognition, only come 2009, which almost like 13 years later. And thank goodness I have been blessed with a lot of opportunity. Now I'm doing quite well, relatively speaking. So I can be called a clinician scientist. I can be recognized internationally. But what is the journey in the first 13 years that get me where I am today? Because that may be more relevant to you is that how would you launch your career if you want to do a academic science? So this is my first publication. Uh, it is a research on, the, on a drug at that time as new, published in cancer, which is quite okay. But what is the story behind that? Well, this does help me to establish my ability as a clinical scientist with clinical research. But what happened is that at that time when I first come back, there's very little funding. And then the little funding I was able to obtain to do this research was actually not able to complete the entire project. So what I have to do is actually get help from various departments. So good thing is that at Chinese University, we're blessed with a lot of uh, helpful colleagues. So even though they're not directly involved in your project, but they're very much willing to help you to do that. So I get a lot of help from my colleagues to be able to launch this very first study such that I was able to publish it, establish my ability as a clinical researcher. And from there, I start doing my drug development. So I won't go through much detail about it next little while, but next moving on to my next major publication, at the New England Journal of Medicine, which is actually one of the top journals uh, in medicine. And I published this as a first offer in 2009. And this actually created a new paradigm of the management of lung cancer. So this paper made me to become internationally recognized. In the same time, is the fact that it changed the practice of lung cancer. How do I get there? <clears throat> well, I think there's a lot of so-called the um, collaboration behind, plus that you really have to have trained your leadership and also you have to be able to um, have the scientific idea to develop it into a what can change the practice with the discovery of the EGFL mutation. So all this, you know, launched it with their clinical research eventually that now I can be recognized as a clinical scientist. But then the next step further is that what did I do in terms of scientific discovery that helped us to or help Hong Kong to launch a so-called a um, molecular diagnostic company. So when I we were doing the EGFR mutation, finding the drug, we find that it's essential to be able to identify the presence of the EGF mutation, which is a molecular genetic biomarker. So while working with Professor Dennis Lowe and then uh, then uh, Tony Yong, uh, which is the author of this paper, is our MPhil student. So we were able to divide a new method using digital PCR to identify this mutation in the blood. And this will be applicable in the clinic so that doctors can use this diagnostic test to find the mutation and start the treatment. So we're transforming something we discover in the laboratory in the university and we said that, hey, this is something that can be utilized for our patient. So we start a company called Stenomic together with Professor Dennis Lowe and Professor Alan Chan. We start the first company in 2015 at the Hong Kong Science Park. We hire some of the students that we have uh, worked with. And then with this laboratory, we expand the service to Hong Kong for the first few years. And subsequently, we established a laboratory in Bangkok in 2018. and then. Subsequently, a few years later, we merged with another genomic company in Taiwan and we sold the company completely in 2022. So this is a whole journey of taking the scientific discovery and commercialize it and make it into a successful company that provides a service to the community. So being a clinical scientist, that is the advantage that you can take a clinical problem and then translation into a solution and take the solution to the public. 
That is exactly what Hong Kong needs. That's exactly what the region will need is to use the scientific innovation and commercialization. But in the last few minutes, I want to share with you what is required in this journey. It's just a little bit of personal experience. I think start with number one criteria, no doubt, diligence, working hard. What you're looking at is a dark hallway in a hospital. I have been walking through this hallway many, many nights, many, many times. And you take your tired body that will work during the day, but people still wake you up at night and you still go to attend the patient. But at the end of this dark hallway, you know there's a patient waiting for you, waiting for you to solve the problem for them. It is a good feeling, but it requires huge diligence to become a doctor, to become a specialist. It is a process that all of us have to go through. And for the same thing, it's the same diligence have to be put into your research because there are a lot of dark time when you are doing your research. The time that you fail with your study, the time that you failed at your research, the time you cannot get money, the grants, and all this are hard work. With the diligence, then you need to be motivated. No one can work hard if there's no motivation. A lot of people can run marathon, but not everyone can finish. There has to be a strong motivation why you want to finish your marathon. In this long <clears throat> journey to become clinical scientist, you have to ask yourself, what motivates you? Is it really the scientific curiosity? Is it really the money behind? Is it the respect? What will be the one reason that motivates you to do all this hard work? So no, I cannot tell you what is what should be motivation, but you have to find yourself the motivation to do all this. The next one for scientists, just like all science field, you have to start with curiosity. The <clears throat> butterfly, you know, starting as a so-called caterpillar. And they actually have the same DNA, but why would they look so different? What is the reason behind it? So those are the kind of questions you ask in every aspect in your scientific venture. So you have to high up your curiosity, train your curiosity, and ask questions. Especially as clinical, sci clinical scientists, when you see a patient with a particular problem, you have to be curious enough to ask why, how did it happen? Rather than just following the guideline, you have to take it beyond the guideline to ask the scientific question in a solution of a problem. But last but not the least, but actually this is not the last, but then whatever work you do, you have to train your communication skill well. Um, whether you're a clinician, whether you are a researcher, being able to communicate your thinking, we're able to influence others with your thinking, that is very important. So through your whole development, you, you need to train your communication as well. But of course, as I stated over and over again, you need to build a team of people working with you. Science is never working alone. There's no longer a mad scientist working in a lab and find something extraordinary. The scientific work is always a collaboration with your team, with other teams, such that you can advance. And then how you work with your team, how you lead the team, that is a skill that you had acquired in the pathway. Now, up to this point, I actually have not mentioned anything about intelligence. As I said, I start off as a dumb kid and I may still be a dumb man. It, you, you, you do need certain degree of intelligence, but you do not need to be high intelligence like Professor Yao. The mathematician, they, they need to be very highly intelligent. But as a clinical scientist, you can be dumber like myself. So, but then you need to have a certain degree of logical thinking, a reasonable memory, then you can take on your career very successfully. But one last thing, this is really the last thing, is that in your journey, you need friendship. You need a lot of good friends around the world. And the picture you see, all of them are friends and collaborators from Europe, United States, Asia. We all work together. As a matter of fact, I'm in a conference right now in Hong Kong, and about six, seven of these friends 
on this picture are actually with me now doing training of the on uh, lung cancer training for the Asia Pacific uh, lung cancer specialists. So all this is a very fruitful and rewarding journey as long as you hold on to the friendship. Allow me to summarize. A clinician scientist is a doctor plus researcher. You have to do both. It is challenging, but yet very much rewarding, both potentially in terms of respect and finance. But this is a very lengthy journey. Take a lot of commitment. Uh, you have to become a specialist. You have to become an academic. But then you do not need to be too smart, but you have to work very hard, motivated, curious, and capable of communication. And then friendship, to me, is the most essential part and also a bonus. So in all, if I can do it, so can you. Thank you so much.